Lord, we praise and we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which you have promised to pour out upon all flesh. We ask, Lord, for this same Lord and giver of life to fall now, to fall afresh upon Father Scott, to open his heart and our own to the message of truth which you are announcing. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just to review a little bit about where we've come from here in the empowerment uh, section of our School of Evangelization. On the, uh, the first day, we covered the idea of the Holy Spirit as the principal agent of evangelization. It's His work from beginning to end in which we are given the grace and the opportunity to cooperate. He is the one who awakens us spiritually and awakens those whom we are evangelizing spiritually. And he is the one who empowers us. He's the one who backs the proclamation of the message and shows it to be real. And then, uh, of course, yesterday we had the great privilege to have uh, Father Bob with us and to speak a little bit about the Lord's dynamic, how that's acted out, how that's sort of uh, realized concretely in very practical steps. What we want to do today is look at some very specific ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us to carry out this mission of evangelization. And that is through the charisms, the charisms of the Holy Spirit. So what is a charism? Well, literally it means a benefit, a favor, a gratuitous gift. A charism is a gift given by the Holy Spirit to an individual for the good of others and the fulfillment of the mission of the church. It's a gift given by the Holy Spirit to an individual for the good of others and the fulfillment of the mission of the church. Now this is, um, this is very much the teaching of the Catholic Church. You can see there's a, there's a quote right from Vatican II Lumen Gentium, which shows us that in addition to what we've already spoken of, things like the Eucharist, the sacraments, there's something else. It is not only through the sacraments and the ministries of the church that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God and enriches it with virtues, but allotting his gifts to everyone according as he wills, he distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. You'll notice that that's for everyone, every rank. So where do these charisms fit in the spiritual life? Well, let's have a look at that before we start getting into the individual charisms themselves. First of all, an obvious statement, the Holy Spirit is the source of all spiritual gifts. He gives them all. Jesus said in John 4.14, the water that I shall give him will become in him a, a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now we know that the water Jesus is referring to there is indeed the Holy Spirit. So we have uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem giving a commentary on that. Why did Christ call the grace of the Spirit water? Because all things are dependent on water. It produces many different effects, one in a palm tree, another in the vine, and so on throughout all of creation. So then, the Spirit makes one man a teacher of divine truth, inspires another to prophesy, and then we can take from that, etc., etc., etc. He does, he has many different fruits in the lives of many different Christians, right? Still with me? All right. Just a couple little distinctions we need to make as well, which will probably help you. There are two different categories of gifts. There are graces that God gives specifically for the good of the receiver, for the individual Christian, and such as sanctifying grace, the life of God which comes into us at baptism, and also the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, or the Isaiah gifts that we all had to memorize when we were confirmed, right? They're given to us for our good. I'll say more about that in a bit. But there's graces that God gives that are not so much for us, but they're for the good of others. He gives us a grace for the good of others. And the charisms fit into this category. They're given to us, yes, but not principally for ourselves, but so that we may serve. It's for the good of others. Does that make sense? All right. So then let's look at how they work together with, uh, how these two sets of gifts work together. 
The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that we know we receive in baptism that are strengthened within, at confirmation, they're like the sails and the rudder on a ship. If you imagine our souls as a ship, while well, these seven gifts that we've received are the sails and the rudders, how are they like sails and rudders? Well, first of all, they make us more alert to discern the will of God. They make us alert to what God wants. And so in that way, they're like a rudder because a rudder is something which points the ship, right? Points it in the right direction. But they're also, they make us more ready to do the will of God and more able to do the will of God. So they're like sails. They catch the wind of the Spirit. They catch the wind so that we are able to move under God's power to what needs to be done, what he would like us to do. The old Baltimore Catechism summarized it very nicely. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are like sails, which enable us to catch the breath of the Holy Spirit, moving the ship of our soul much faster and farther than we could ever sail it by using the virtues themselves. So it gives us the ability to move with the Holy Spirit, those seven gifts that we've received in baptism and strengthened in confirmation. Now, we know that every Christian has the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just as every ship in the, in the fleet has sails and a rudder. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the fleet. It would be left behind. It couldn't get anywhere, right? So that's, that's what the, the, uh, the seven gifts are like on the, the vessel, which is the ship of our souls. So what are the charisms then? How do they fit in? Well, they're like specialized equipment that help us carry out our part of the mission. They empower us to take on the mission of Christ in a particular way, to be a vessel of God's mercy, God's power, God's message, God's wisdom, in a very particular way in the whole mission of evangelization. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says it very beautifully, number 2003. But grace also includes the gifts of, that the Spirit grants us to associate us with his work, to enable us to collaborate in the salvation of others and in the growth of the body of Christ, the church. It's important to recognize that every Christian receives some charisms. Every Christian receives some charisms. Why? Because we all have something we're called to do. We're all given a special task, right, within the body of Christ. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for the common good, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. Now, each of us is given different charisms according to our call and our place and our mission in the body of Christ. Going back to our little analogy of the ship, if our souls are a ship, well, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit they're like the sail and like the rudders. But if you look at a fleet, it has different kinds of ships in it, doesn't it? They have battleships that are rigged with artillery and certain other weaponry to enter into direct combat. You've got hospital ships, which are specially designed to pick up survivors and out of the water, rescue boats. Uh, uh, they're equipped with all that's necessary to heal the people that have been wounded in battle. You have supply ships which bring all the supplies to the other ships, otherwise they would be lost. Uh, exploration ships, ships that can, you know, that are, that are specially designed to sort of find new places, new avenues, new trading routes, all those sorts of things. Um, ships which are equipped for fishing, uh, for whaling, whatever. Uh, and then, of course, rescue ships. So you've got, and, and I'm sure the list could go on, you've got all sorts of different ships that are needed within the fleet. Well, in the same way, each of us are equipped in a particular manner to carry out the mission that God calls us to. Equipped with charisms according to our call and our place and our mission in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. It's a good analogy, isn't it? I can't take credit for it. That's Father Terry's work back there. So he, uh... Uh, Charisms, as well, it's important to say, enable us to act beyond our natural talents. All right? What we could do naturally, the charism gives us an ability to do it well beyond what we could do naturally. Very often they're building on our natural talents, but they take us far beyond what is humanly possible. And we'll see that acted out when we get into the individual charisms themselves. 
So moving on then, just want to make a little commentary about this. How many charisms are there? Actually, the truth is we don't know. We don't know. There are so many. The lists, in fact, uh, the way they're written appear to be incomplete. St. Paul leaves the door open to there being all sorts of, of charisms, the scriptures do, and the church as well. Often they overlap. They look, you know, is this, it only seems like a slightly different emphasis on the same gift. Well, they, they can be very similar, very close together. Um, as well, the gifts and the names that we apply to the gifts can change depending on translations of the scripture and all sorts of things. So even you've probably seen categories of charisms before and, you know, they were organized somewhat differently. Well, that's okay because it's not as always easy. I mean, we sort of group them in certain ways to make sense of them, but there are many, many charisms, many gifts. Our lists are not exhaustive. In other words, just like St. Cyril of Jerusalem was telling us, as water is the source of so many different, you know, uh, plant life and fruits and life, and, and so too there are manifold numbers of charisms. Some charisms come specifically with an office, so when someone undertakes an office in the church, they receive a charism. Now, the most obvious would be the charism of infallibility, which comes when someone is elected to, to be the vicar of Christ on earth, the pope, right? Okay. But there are other ones as well. Some charisms are very outstanding. They're dramatic. They're extraordinary. You know, miracles and healing and prophecy. But we shouldn't forget that others are more simple and widely diffused as the church says in Lumen Gentium, in its document on the church. Administration, service, hospitality. Now, they don't get a lot of glory. They don't get a lot of headlines, but they too, gifts given, charisms given by the Holy Spirit, not so much for the person's own good, but for the upbuilding of the church and the good of others. Amen. Now, you'll see there in front of you categories of charisms. Categories of charisms. And you know, if you run into a different uh, set of categories and they arrange it slightly differently, don't panic. Uh, we do our best, but St. Paul never laid them out in categories, so he leaves us to do that extra work. This one comes from Sherry Waddell's book, The Catholic uh, Spiritual Gifts Inventory, an inventory we really highly recommend if you do want to understand more about how God has gifted you and how to exercise those gifts uh, more powerfully. But you can see them there, the pastoral charisms, organizational charisms, communication charisms, lifestyle charisms, healing or sign charisms, charisms of understanding, and then, of course, creative charisms. So what we want to do now is we want to have a look at each of these charisms and see how they contribute to the mission of evangelization that we're discussing. Some of you will recognize yourselves and say, ah, that's a gift that the Holy Spirit has given me. So understanding it more deeply can help you to yield to it more fully. Some of you might be asking, I really don't know, saying I really don't know what my charisms are. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come to the gifts empowerment session tomorrow night so that we can all open up and to receive the fullness of what God wants. But we want to look at these charisms now and see how they operate in the mission of the church how that special equipment works. So let's look at encouragement then. Encouragement empowers a Christian to be an effective channel of God's love, nurturing others through his or her presence and words of comfort, encouragement, or counsel. Now a beautiful and powerful example of that is the night that Pope John Paul II was elected to the papacy. He was in his room in his study, sort of with the weight of the world upon him, so the story goes, uh, you know, looking at all that he had just inherited, the problems of the church and everything else, and feeling, you know, the distress of that. Well, prompted by the Holy Spirit, a Franciscan friar, Father Rinero Cantalame, who was teaching history at the time, felt prompted by God to go into St. Peter's Square. He looked up at the window with the light still on, late in the night, and he yelled out, Coraggio, John Paul! Or, courage, John Paul. Courage, John Paul. Well, the Holy Father was, was uplifted. I mean, he heard God's voice in this. The next day, he, he wanted to know. He asked, you know, who was that little Franciscan friar that was out there in the courtyard last night? 
And he had that Franciscan friar brought to him. Now, you can imagine what Father Renero was thinking. Oh, no, I'm going to get it chewed out for having <laughs> disturbed his sleep or something. But no, what he did is he appointed him preacher to the papal household. And to this day, Father Renero's job is to encourage the Holy Father, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's a powerful way that God can use someone. Helps. Helps empowers a Christian to be a channel of God's goodness by using his or her talents or charisms to enable other individuals to serve God and people more effectively. There, it tends to be a gift which is hard to define because it can encompass many different gifts. But it helps empower someone in their own life, their own walk, their own ministry in the spirit. One example of that is uh, someone by the name of Henri LeMay, so some of you know him, high school guidance, uh, high school teacher, I think, guidance counselor, and someone came to him drug addicted and in all sorts of troubles, and he was able to put his gifts at the use to help this young man in all sorts of ways so that he sort of became everything that God was calling him to be. So it helped him and helps others to achieve what God's purpose is in their life. Hospitality. Hospitality empowers a Christian to be a generous channel of God's love, warmly welcoming and caring for those in need of food, shelter, and friendship. Now, a beautiful example of this is the love and the hospita hospitality of the Grey Nuns from Montreal, especially in the early founding days. Story is told how they would just, they would love people so much as they were taking care of them. And they would do all sorts of small things that would make such a difference. The pictures of Jesus and Mary and the saints that were in the rooms, they would move them on a regular basis so that people had, you know, a new picture to look at. And then they would explain the meaning of them. And so through their warmth, their love, uh, their hospitality, their warm and welcoming sort of feel, many people were led to deeper relationships with, with Jesus through their hospitality, the way they took care of people, loved people, opened their lives to people. Mercy. Mercy empowers a Christian to be a channel of God's love through practical deeds of compassion that relieve the distress of those who suffer and help them experience God's love. Those of us who live in this area are very blessed to have uh, Fred Schubert carrying out his ministry, especially here. Uh, Fred was actually once a companion to the Cross Seminarian. And God called him to a very particular ministry of mercy. And he founded an outreach to street people called, you know, His Mercy. There's a little uh, excerpt here from um, our Sunday visitor that I'm just going to read, which captures the essence of what this charism looks like. Evangelization, according to Fred Schubert, consists in large part of the constant myriad of little things done well for love of God and love of neighbor. Schubert should know. Over the past five years, he has taken this approach to evangelization into two poor neighborhoods of Ottawa, making a space where Anna, this was someone mentioned earlier in the article, uh, someone in need, where Anna and those like her can experience hands-on God's kingdom. We really exist to bring the message of the divine mercy, who Jesus is, to those who need to hear it the most, Schubert told our Sunday visitor. We exist to show the people in these places the most marginalized, the most socially stigmatized, that Jesus loves them, the church loves them, and we love them as well. Our message is the gospel, we live among them. Powerful example of the charism of mercy leading people to experience the compassion and the love of Jesus himself. Pastoring. Pastoring empowers a Christian to be an effective channel of God's love and build Christian community by nurturing the relationships and long-term spiritual growth of a group. Now, those, of, uh, those people here who belong to St. Mary's Parish or uh, have been associated or been around here know that this charism was very profoundly revealed in the life of the founder of our own community, Father Bob Bedard. He came in and through nurturing relationships, drawing people together into community, uh, you know, uh, teaching the truth, uh, bringing, I mean, he just pastored this little parish into a full-blown revival, really. People coming alive, people being attracted, people coming to a whole new relationship to Jesus 
through his pastoring that charism was very powerfully illustrated and, it, and the fruits were so very obvious. Another example of that, probably more widely known, is Jean Vanier. Jean Vanier, who founded L'Arche communities which take care of handicapped people. Well, I mean, the, the movement has spread throughout the world, right? But it's through his charism of pastoring that that was able to happen. That was able to happen. Let's look then at organizational charisms. Leadership is the first one that I want to touch on there. Leadership empowers a Christian to be an agent of God's purposes by sharing a compelling vision of a better future with others and directing the overall efforts of a group as they work together to make the vision of a, real, a reality. Now what's key here is they're able to communicate something that fires up the hearts of people. They're able to lead people to a place, uh, um, a compelling vision of what can happen. Many of you uh, know Andre Renier, who founded Catholic Christian Outreach. When you hear Andre speak, your heart starts to burn. It's like, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to get on side with that. I want to I want to be I want to be a part of that. That's the gift of leadership. Provides a compelling vision and helps us to get there. Um, my friend James Mikolasik, who's over here as well, who is uh, Drexnet Canada. If you hear him speak about the ministry and the mission that they've founded, you get the same thing that happens. It fires you up. You want to be on board. So it's that gift of leadership. Now leadership needs the next gift that we have on that list there, which is administration. Administration empowers a Christian to be an effective channel of God's wisdom by providing the planning and coordination needed to accomplish good things. Sometimes leaders have a great vision and they can inspire people, but they can't get there. They don't have the hands-on practical skills to make it happen. And administrators do. They know how to get things done. They know how to see what needs to be done and in what order it needs to be done in order to make sure it comes about. Uh, Paul Cromner of uh, Catholic Renewal Ministries, Lift, the Lift Jesus Higher rally organizer, is a perfect example of that. The movement was doing okay, but it wasn't really on fire. But he came in with that charism, and the thing just exploded. Just exploded. In our own community, I see it time and time again in our community because we've got some great visionaries, but we've got one priest in the community on the council, our, our vice rector, Father Rick, who can immediately start saying, if that's where we want to go, this is what we have to do. Here's our obstacles. This is how we need to coordinate ourselves to make sure that this happens. Oh, and don't forget about this and this. These are realities that are going to come into... So he's already bringing the vision into concrete terms. How do we get there? Now, the reason I'm spending time on that is administration is sometimes not considered a charism, but it is a charism. And without the charism, leadership can often fall flat. So we need administration. It's not the glory. You're not up front, people applauding you. But it's so very necessary, so very necessary. Another organizational charism is giving. Giving empowers a Christian to be a cheerful channel. I think cheerful needs to be underlined there. Cheerful channel of God's provision by giving with exceptional generosity to those in need. Now, every pastor wants a whole parish full of people with the charism of giving. <laughs> but there are those who have really received a charism, a charism in generosity to support things. A couple of examples, sort of the pizza magnate Thomas Monahan. He said he will spend $200 million, that's American dollars, to move uh, the Catholic, his Catholic university, Ave Maria, to Florida and to build a town to support it on some close to 6,000 acres. This is a man who's got the charism of giving. He is supporting an incredibly great work. And that's something that is a work of the Holy Spirit in him. Another example, uh, a woman that I had the great opportunity of meeting, Rose Totino. She and her husband founded uh, Totino's Pizza way back when, a very faithful and wonderful Catholic. Her financial support uh, enabled Net Ministries in the United States to sort of get off the ground and keep running. 
And that wasn't the only one. There was other evangelical ministries that she kind of helped going. Now, the lesson that you should draw from this is that pizza is godly. <laughs> okay? Eat as much pizza as you possibly can because it will advance your ability to give. No. <laughs> but it is funny how, uh, you know, the, both examples, Father Terry and I thought that was rather funny anyway. It's just because I like pizza that we're using these examples. But giving a gift of the Holy Spirit. We're all called to give, but this is a particular work of the Holy Spirit. Service. Service empowers a Christian to be a channel of God's purposes by recognizing the logistical gaps or unmet needs that can prevent good things from happening, and by personally doing whatever it takes to solve the problem and meet the need. These are the troubleshooters. These are the people that the Holy Spirit gives the gift of seeing what needs to be done and filling that gap. Doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to matter where it is. There's several of these people that, that in the Companions of the Cross that we're, it seems like we're always going to them. They're always seeing the need and filling the need, you know? And they're a tremendous blessing to us. Sometimes we feel guilty, but they're like, no, this is, this is what God is prompting them to do. It's a gift in the Holy Spirit. Let's move into communication charisms. Evangelism. This empowers a Christian to be an effective channel of God's love by sharing the faith with others in a way that draws them to become disciples of Jesus and responsible members of the church. Now, we are all called to evangelize, right? Because it is the essential mission of the church. But what we're talking about here is people in whom the Holy Spirit acts in such a way that they're like magnets. They just draw people to Jesus. It, they just, there's something about them, a gift given by the Holy Spirit, that they attract people to Jesus very easily and quickly. It was a very good friend of mine that I lived with going to university in Victoria, and we would go out doing evangelization on the streets, and I, you know, I would be lucky if I would talk. He would, there were people that he would be talking to, they were just drawn to him. It's a special charism, special charism. We've got seminarians that do that. They go out, and it's just all of a sudden, they're, they're they're in dialogue. They're leading people to Jesus. Just over, you know, so it's a special charism. John Paul II. Very obvious in him, isn't it? He goes to places and people, the young people especially, the world youth days, are just, even just his presence is, is yearning, stirring up something. that They want Jesus more. Just even being around him. Teaching. Teaching empowers a Christian to be a channel of God's truth. God's truth and his wisdom by enabling others to learn information and skills that help them reach their fullest spiritual and personal potential. They're able to break open the truth in such a way that it empowers the body of Christ. Um, there's some beautiful, I believe you have in your handout, some beautiful quotes from St. Augustine about his experience of St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose, who had the gift of teaching, broke open the mysteries, and it was crucial to the conversion of St. Augustine, who was just a man hungry for truth. Hungry for truth. So a teacher is one who can break it open and excite and, and, and equip people. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn was mentioned earlier. His tapes, his teachings... They just, they spread all over the place and they're drawing all sorts of people into the church. His teaching on the Catholic Church, he, he said that he's discipling, personally discipling right now, 100 Protestant pastors who are moving into the Catholic Church. His teaching has that effect, right? So it's, it's a powerful example of how the gift of teaching can really serve. Now, that's the extraordinary, but very often it's very ordinary ways very ordinary things. You've, you've met people who can teach in such a way that it's empowering. You know? Amen? Amen? All right. I'm running short of time. I've got to move along here. Prophecy. Prophecy empowers a Christian to be a channel of divine truth and wisdom by communicating a word or call of God to individuals or a group through inspired words or actions. They're able to give God's interpretation to something right here, right now. Bring God's word. It's a, a very particular gift. Um, 
One example that I've got of this, uh, one of the priests in our community, Father Dennis Hayes, I served as an intern to him on my pastoral year. And we would have Father for dinner on Sunday afternoons. You know, this is when he would get to meet his parishioners and do his home visitations. And I always, always come with him. Well, we would be sitting at table, and this happened a number of times. We'd be sitting at table, and he would just get a word. He would get a, something prophetic for someone there. And I remember once, we're sitting there ch- talking, and he sort of looks over and he says, and it doesn't matter what was said, it, it was personal in nature, but he said, does this mean anything to you? And of course, the woman's face went sheet white. She started to cry, and about an hour later, those two and their guests were all receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit from Father Dennis's <laughs> ministry, okay? He led them right, and it all broke open because God had given him something that God wanted to say something to this woman, and he was able to speak out that word, and it just, it opened things up. There's a danger that we need to mention with prophecy, and that is the danger of illuminism. It has plagued the church for many centuries. Illuminism is when we see the interior illumination that I get, basically, is the source of all truth. Doesn't matter what the church says, doesn't matter what anybody else says, I get this word and that's the truth. Okay? It's not true. All prophesying is imperfect, says St. Paul. It all has to be tested. And one of the ways we test it is against scripture and tradition and the magisterium, the teaching of the church. And there are those within the church who have the charism and the office to discern those things. The bishops, the pastors of the churches. So God has an order for these things to be carried out. Amen? Amen. Tongues. Now tongues, um, I'm going to speak of uh, two types of tongues, if you will. And I'll hopefully try to pull this together. A lot of times there's a great deal of confusion about tongues. And uh, all sorts of different teaching. But we're sort of giving you the consensus of really the best scripture scholars. First of all, there's public tongues. Now these are where God empowers a Christian to speak in a divinely, a divinely inspired message in a language that he or she has never learned. Okay? And on the other side of it then would be interpretation of tongues, which I'll get to in a moment. Now that can be one of two things. It could be unintelligible speech, as St. Paul calls it. You know, it's not sort of a human language. It's just unintelligible speech. But someone, through another gift of the Spirit, the interpretation, is able to understand it and able to say what God is communicating. Public tongues. Sometimes it happens rarely, but there are instances recorded where it has happened where someone is speaking out a tongue in a language that they have no knowledge of. A human language they have no knowledge of. You know, someone is speaking out and somebody in the crowd recognizes, it. whoa, that's, that's the language of my tribe in Africa or whatever, you know. So that does happen, um, but it seems to be rarely. So the other type of tongues would be the private gift of tongues. It's for an individual. It's the more common experience, and it has no need for interpretation. It really is a gift of prayer for an individual. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, says St. Paul, but to God. For no one understands him but he utters utters mysteries in the spirit. He's praying to God, either praise or intercession or whatever. That's mostly what we experience. For if I pray pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, even though my mind is unfruitful, says St. Paul. It's a prayer of praise or intercession or whatever, but it's an intercessory gift. Now I mentioned public tongues comes with another gift and that's interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues empowers a Christian to be a channel of God's truth, direction, or encouragement by making known in the vernacular, that's in English in our case, or whatever, the contents of a public message or prophecy delivered in tongues. Now, that's not the same thing as direct translation. Someone has uh, the gift of, of public tongues, and they stand up and they deliver a message. Someone knows Someone knows what that means. They know the content of the message. They might not understand syllables there, but they understand the meaning, and they're able to get up then, and by the gift of the Spirit, to say exactly what that is all about. Um, Now, it's important to just mention, we're going to continue and finish this list of charisms tomorrow and leading up to our empowerment session tomorrow night. 
Some of these charisms uh, happen, if you will, very naturally. We can just do them, like the gift of teaching. It would just happen as you teach, right? Others are only exercised at the prompting of the Spirit. You can't just prophesy. You have to be prompted to prophesy. Um, interpretation of tongues, public tongues, discernment of spirits, or other gifts like that. So that is where I'm going to break today, and we'll finish off that list tomorrow.